producers, as I still am <laughs> Harriet, I'm the poet half of, the, um, of this collaboration. We, uh, Judy and I, have worked together since 2011 <laughs> in various <laughs> different sites for many of them in Lincolnshire. Yeah, so I'm Judy Tucker and I'm a painter and visual artist. And while we have a collaborative practice, that our work can also be seen individually. So what we're going to do actually is we thought, you know, there hasn't really, well I thought, it's not been enough poetry yet. So I'm going to, to, to read from this beautiful salt word, which is our new book, which is being launched here now in this library. <laughs> Although, um, yes, uh, it's been seen by one or two other people uh, earlier, yeah, who were here earlier, which is gone. Um, so I'm just going to read from this, and then we're going to sort of unpack um, a little bit about, you know, what makes this work, or how this work is made out of, everything that Nick has just talked about in fact. Pioneering, breaking salt pan, stalking, then branching, cord grass flags, spartina green, bubbles surface, slows water down, building sediment, mud, land. Glasswort, Glaucus, globular, stirring, moving out over open, dark mud flats, climbing under, up, tiny banks, not quite branching, bracting, all stem and stalk, braving tide for bright spring sight. Cochlearia, podding up, storing water, Anglica with a catch, single serration, distinguishes separation from self. Scurvy grass, spoonwort, asorbic bite, tiny whites cleansing, flowing up through soft grey purslane rosettes, crab corpse strewn bladderack, first flower of salt marsh, purging, wave leaved, yellow eyed tangle under singing lark skies. Bees browse plantago up, stem up, stigma. To wind quake, fruit flick, breathe salt in, out, each cell hold water behind yellow. Tripolium, leaves lancelate, lifts lilac rays on rays, out yellow centers, sea aster bees fly out, from sand mines hold back long wings to feed their one and only sweet song. Sings whiter words to fade, silvered out thrift, lavender, light, living in air, flipped husks, skeletal flower within, out flower. Seed plantain specks, get fallen, get under salt, rain gold wet to wait. Monetius purslane, elliptical leafed, overworn, silver green, soft, sharp, her red styles, his yellow anthers, through many shades in flowering wind on high marsh, gold brown haze, red pink ochre, future seeding, sprawling spread, wider widening sward, contracting channels, taking sweet rains into salt floods. High tide swept, down fallen over his, her selves, weeping onto wetland waste, plastic scraps, beareth out winter, losing little. Ridge ringed red in rain salt water, winter Saint Pierre remembers, fused fire with sand into glass light. Sliver silvered by reed grass rush, seeded into wrap strewn land, under aster stalk heights, sea blight twine twists. So, what we're going to do for the rest of the talk is um, we're going to talk about how our sort of recent work from our sustained field work and engagement with this area, with specifically a tiny bit of uh, marsh at the end of Humberston. Uh, beach and the Tetley Marshes. 
Um, how that work with Saltmarsh Plant Life has fed into our creative work and how we made this book that I've just been reading from. And perhaps really most importantly in this context, what we're going to try and do is to just sort of pull together some of these ideas that we've been floating around today about science and ecology in relation to artistic practice. And I think, you know, the inspiration for this day really is that it's a truism that we need to close um, or inhabit perhaps those disciplinary gaps to really understand our environment, particularly those gaps that exist between the arts and the sciences, and so we need to work together. Um, Rachel Carson's a great hero of mine, I'm sure some of you have heard of her, so she's the environmental, she was an environmental scientist. Uh, when she received the um, National Book Award in non-fiction in 1952, she said, it seems to me that there can be no separate literature of science. If there is poetry in my book about the sea, it is not because I deliberately put it there, but because no one can write truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. And at the same time, that was one of my inspirations, uh, starting to think about this project. At the same time, the objectivist poet Laurie Niedecker, who's a great uh, inspiration to me, writing in 1958 to Louis Zukowski. For me, when it comes to birds, animals and plants, I'd like the facts, because facts are wonderful in themselves. So I think it's in the meeting of those facts with the poetic and the artistic that we might find some kind of mind-changing understanding. And that's in a sense what we're exploring with here. Um, and it's, it's just brilliant to follow Mick, actually, because there are just so many amazing facts, you know, <laughs> wonderful in themselves there. So if you're just going to talk about the art, and I'll come back and talk about poetry a bit more. Well, we've already had more than an introduction to Techni Marshes, but in the particular case of this salt marsh, and the specifically adapted plants that grow there, we must recognise that the threat that such bioregions have been under is from as early as Roman times, when they first began to be reclaimed from the sea. Now, of course, modern developments, climate change, and hard sea defences erode them even further, threatening saltwork plants along with their habitats. Though pioneering colonisers that we've been hearing about, such as cordgrass and sanfa, are still taking back beaches and establishing sedimentation. It's important for humans to understand and to respect not least the importance of these areas as permeable barriers to flood. So how might or how does painting and poetry embody or engage with some of these ideas? Or to put it another way, why might painting plants matter now? How might a deep exploration of plants through paint help us understand our place in the world? What does it mean to understand a locale like the salt marsh through an intense study of what is growing close at hand? Of course, there is the provocation to slow down, to give attention to detail and specificity. This reflects our renewed relation with nature, those places we've come to value so much, where we go to catch our breath and connect to the more than human world. Working together, and this is um, one of the walls from our recent exhibition at 2021, working together as artist and poet help us to try and combat different anthropocentric perspectives by an open, exploratory approach full of repetitions and variations. Our texts and images appear together in different guises, concrete, discursive, online and sonic. Seen either on the wall or in the book together, the viewer can perceive language spatially and read painting and poem together. Our two disciplines work together against the distancing and objectification that a single form can produce, complementing each other and attempting to offer space for the viewer to be in conversation with the work, to be the third component of the equation, and thus to question as in this case, what a salt marsh plant is and does. However, the visual conversation that our work engenders, with its focus on the up-close world of plants, is not simply just in dialogue or in conversation with each other, but also, for me, with earlier scientific, aesthetic and design representations of plants. And I work with and against the rich traditions of many and various aesthetic means of this, 
from botanical decoration, as we've just seen, to decoration and design, to a reversal of this kind of thing, and the reworking of ideas of landscape painting now as immersive rather than a view. So for me, the paintings and poems operate somewhere between close observation and lyricism, almost sitting between these two, sitting between the tradition of Dura's great piece of turf and this piece, this painting from the Dulwich Picture Gallery, um, Landscape with Sportsman and Game. And the reason I put this particular painting in is because of the blue um, leaves in front, which are in fact not intended by the artist, it's due to a fugitive pig pigment, a pigment that's faded. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, that coloration absolutely drew me to that mm -hmm. piece when mm -hmm. I saw it. And it's something that I had in mind, which I think you might see when you look at some of my paintings. Yet, these paintings also acknowledge contemporary ways of imaging, photography, filmic, even microscopic in approach, thus exploring issues pertinent to contemporary painting. And I want to think about the works and the plants as a microcosm of a wider landscape, engaging us with notions of the differences between growing and being cultivated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at one of the paintings, this one, Dark March, Marsh, Silvered Out. And you'll notice that what I do is I have a nod to my collaboration in my titles. So even if my work is shown separately from Harriet's poems, the titles have all got a phrase of Harriet's poetry in there, so I'm pointing towards that at all times. Um, and this, if we look at this as an example, maybe this will become clearer. I think, anyway, the painting is sumptuous. It's uncanny, but curiously precise all at the same time. But this precision is both more and less than the, the traditional botanic or scientific illustration, where plants by necessity are often um, considered individually as specimens. Although recent layouts, like in these, and I can see we've got lots of examples there, the field study guides actually are now starting to work against that, mm. putting um, mm. the plants together in a way that reflects some of this ecological thinking. So the painting might be precise on the one hand, but it's also shifting and uncertain. The painted plants crisscross and weave across the surface. Each stem, petal or dried pappus is given equal weight as the other. And in turn, the rich, murky, sandy water out of which they grow is considered as important as the plants. Perhaps pointing to what Mick was talking about. Perhaps pointing to the importance of ecological interconnectedness, the inclusion of the water seeks to imply and hint at, rather than be overly didactic about, the impacts of environmental change or biodiversity, reminding the viewer that while the salt marsh plants protect, they themselves are, of course, obviously vulnerable to sea level rise. So, we can see that some of the painting's apparent beauty belies darker and melancholic attributes plants as symptom of loss, or perhaps as a contemporary take on the traditional idea of memento mori. For, as we know, um, the invitation to look slowly and the focus on the specificity and minutia of plants comes at this moment of wider global trauma, both in terms of climate crisis and its corollary, the alarming biodiversity loss. So the focus on the fragility of the more than human life, specifically the endangered nature of plant species, is not new. It might be a reinterpretation, perhaps, of the tradition of the Memento Mori of Antos, paintings which reflect the material decay and the futility of worldly human life. Using flowers as a metaphor and symbol of this was commonplace, as you see in this example. You can see that I draw on and point to some of that, those traditions in my work. Images of sharply lit flowers on a dark background. But mine, of course, are not cut flowers arranged in a vase. In these paintings, through scale and viewpoint, I attempt to address the plant as, an equal, as equally important, to redress in some way the anthropocentric view. But this painting is about, it's a bit bigger than the screen, it's 120 centimetres by 160 centimetres, so it's large. So when you see it, you are meeting it mm. as an equal. Mm. Um, 
Plants, not, plants are not only a metaphor. We acknowledge these plants are key for our planet. So our, painting, our paintings and play, poems play with scale and hence value in that plants are defamiliarised, seen very closely so that the human eye seems restricted and plants the centre of action and focus. No walker would see a plant like this. Mm. You'd have to be lying low in the marsh, as close as an insect to the flower head. The uncanniness of the paintings cannot be reduced to the sublime, the picturesque or the beautiful. The very juxtaposition of the two disciplines contributes to a shift in scale as macro plants loom over micro letters and lines of poems. Now, as much, all this is as much about aesthetics and taste, making and understanding what is beautiful in new ways. And as Alexandra Harris notes in Nature Writing <coughs> and Writing and Landscape Art, we're in the midst of a new era of place perception in Britain. Questions of what landscapes mean to us, who sees them, and what they are all for are all being debated now with an intensity perhaps unmatched since the first age of domestic tourism, landscape painting, and aesthetic philosophy in the late 18th century. Work on the history of landscape art as influential roles play today, more so than ever. So you, please join in this conversation <laughs> about the place of art and its history of art in our national understandings of today. We've just heard how wilding or rewilding is becoming more widely understood in the field. And we feel our work contributes in that way to in an aesthetic parallel. We only have to look at the Facebook posts on I Love Tea Thoughts to understand the debate which Mick was pointing to about the salt marsh and beach right here, right now. So um, obviously aesthetics, colour, environment, all of these are great concerns of us, but what I'm going to focus on here um, is the relationship of language, naming, space and place to plant life. Now, I'm actually going to unpack some of the poems I read earlier, but I now see that they're actually very small on this screen, so I don't know if they can get bigger. If they can't, I'll just do it anyway. Um, I'll just talk about it anyway. Uh, so, how can language and naming and space and page, how can it acknowledge, even represent, what I'm going to call the agency and intelligence of plants, which has been explored by all sorts of recent thinkers like Anthony Chiravas and John Ryan, they're writing about the mind of plants, that phrase. Um, and it's only when we really embarked on this current project into saltwater um, salt marsh plants that I was to learn to respect what's called the agential powers of salt marsh plants. By that I mean they have agency, they act in the world like we do. And I think this is quite hard for people to take in because we exist in a sort of hierarchy, we still think hierarchically, you know, the humans at the top, then we've got mammals, then we've got others sort of less important creatures, birds probably come in there, and then, you know, we go down to plants and our little weeds at the bottom. We've got to kind of we've got to get rid of that thinking, haven't we, really? So um, why have they, they got such agency? Well, one is that they're pioneers. We've talked about that a lot, so we'll talk more about it. Um, another that's particularly extraordinary, I think, is the way in which halophytes, so these kind of plants that can tolerate salt water, um, can survive salination, that they do something that's called plant water relations. That's the name of it, which is that they deal with all these different kinds of water, rainwater, river water, the estuary, the seawater, and they deal with the levels of salt and the, and the flooding and all these things, and they adjust to it constantly. So they're actually acting in order to do that. And what they're doing is they're making rooted and cellular decisions. So they're pumping ions back out of the cytoplasm. They're um, exercising mechanisms of what's called exclusion, shedding, dilution. So they're taking all these really energetic actions that are necessary for their survival in relation to tide and weather. So what I began to conceive of was that each cell was active and engaged. So there's not just one, but many brains at work in each plant. That's another way of thinking about plants. They don't really have brains like us. You know, if they've got brains at all, they've got lots and lots of brains. And they're all in their cells kind of doing these things. Uh, but also between plants, because Mick's given us some great examples of the symbiotic relationships between plants and, plant, and also plants and um, insects. Um, so 
If you conceive of these relations, then you get this idea that multiple active agencies are at work here. So if you look at a poem like this that's kind of spread you know, across the page, that to some extent is an embodiment of Marsh Mosaic. So the words are attempting to embody that even before you actually read them. Since you can't read them from there, that's lucky. Um, <laughs> but also in this poem about Pursley, I've actually referred to other extraordinary, wonderful facts about plants, which is how they reproduce and their variations in how they reproduce, which again has been touched on by Mick. So some of them are hermaphroditic, some of them are malicious. They've all got these different ways. And in this poem, I've tried to explore that with her red styles, his yellow anthers. So the same plant has got both those things going on. And I've also got the line there, taking sweet rains into salt floods. So I'm talking about that way in which they deal with those things. So these are the wonderful facts, it says, that we look at, um, referred to. So I think what's key for people working artistically with these things is to get to um, the feeling and mystery of what is known and what is not known. So all the time when you hear scientists and ecologists talking, they say, well, we used to think this and now we think that. You know, that is one of the things that I think art can take on, in a sense, that kind of history. But we also stay very attached to field work. And I think this is something that, again, scientists and artists both do, but they don't realise they're both doing it. Um, they're very close to the seasonal changes, to the environmental factors, to the very dominance, for example, of grass, mud, sand, the relation to sea, creeks, salt pans and pools, all of those things that we're taking on board uh, when we're talking about plants and looking at them. So I experience and embody salt marsh much more as a mosaic than as a set of zones, even though that zonal language is often used by people writing about plants. Because when you actually go there and you look on the ground, they're not in the places they're meant to be. You know, <laughs> they're not doing necessarily what they're meant to do. And I think that's really important to stay close to the reality. So we try to do that in the shape of the structure of our new salt work book. So what we're doing is we start very um, low down the beach and we move higher up basically. So, and we also start in spring and we move to winter. As you might have noticed from that reading, I should have chose the spring, um, moving through the summer and then uh, the autumn, the siesta, and the winter, um, the south fire winter at the, end, at the end of that reading. Um, and the first book in the, in, poem in the book is this poem about cool grass because cool grass is such an incredible pioneer plant. And again, you can see the shape, what I'm doing there, is I'm showing the way that plant reaches out and builds land. I'm also even just sort of pointing to the shape of the cool grass. It looks a bit like a flag at certain times of the year. So that kind of innovative use of language is something that I think is, again, an engagement between the scientific or environmental writing that I've read and my own kind of more, um, you know, mad creative writing. Um, and Travis is really interested me in this, this molecular biologist who writes about plant intelligence, because he actually deturns the language used about animals and uses it to refer to plants, which gives us a completely new way of seeing them. So he says, for example, just as the roving animal locates potential food and moves towards it, growing plants have to identify the locations of richest support of resources in their surrounding space and grow towards them in order to capture them. So their, act, their growth is a slow movement. So just because they're rooted, it doesn't mean they don't move, you know, which is one of, again, we kind of think like ourselves all the time. We think, oh, well, you know, they're just sort of stuck there. But they're not, of course, they're moving all the time through the air, through their own movement across the land, and also through seeding, of course, it's a dispersal of seed, whether it be on someone's boots um, or some other way. And so that's, try, uh, I think, Traoris is trying to erode our hierarchy, in a sense, because he says, they move too slowly for us and below our ability to easily see. And I love that phrase, it's like kind of us that's failing there. You know, we're the ones who can't see. It's not their fault that we don't perceive them in that way. So I tried to get that into the, um, the uh, glasswork poem, where I've used a lot of these present participles, stirring, moving, branching, bracting, and then the phrase braving tide. And that braving is about kind of, wow, you know, are they incredible? Now I'm sounding like you with your eggs, Nicola. <laughs> are they incredible? You know, the way in which they survive, you know, in this extraordinary uh, landscape. So I'm constantly trying to bring out that sense of agency and that sense of an embodied thinking process that they're engaging in and that I'm trying to get into um, the text and the way I'm using the language and the space on the page. Um, in doing this, to some extent what we're doing in this project, and it's very much the case in, in Judy's um, 
paintings that we struggle to put the book together in some ways because it's like kind of they're not plant portraits you know so it's not like this is a picture of this plant and this is the poem that goes with it you know always other plants are creeping in so while some of them may focus on one plant there's always something else because the title salt word is saying you know all those kind of plants not just one of them and how they exist um, in an ecosystem so I think both of us are really interested in, in eroding some kind of hierarchical thinking about how we consider our own human minds in relation to the mind of plants in kind of new and exciting ways. And one of the ways I do that, and this is sort of common in my work for years anyway, but is that I pretty much don't use the lyric eye, so I don't use the poet's eye voice, which a lot of people associate with poetry, because I find that even if you try and do that in a very sensitive, kind of embodied way, immediately, you know, as soon as you say I, that big kind of I letter is dominating the poem, you know, it becomes more important, basically. So I'm trying to get the language of poetry being taken over by the language of plants and allow that kind of poet person to be sort of suppressed, um, and, you know, and all this kind of babbling just disappears. I'm trying to get into the, the plant world. Not that I'm suggesting I'm babbling. <laughs> um, so yeah, radical imagining. Um, but at the same time, we cannot write out the age-old cultural significance of plants to humans. I use Gerard's herbal and cull pepper, lots of herbals actually, particularly Gerard, um, in writing this book and thinking about this book, because in here we see all these histories of both medicine and food, and that's what our predecessors came to the marsh for, and yet that knowledge is so lost. Yeah. We are still eating the sound fire, by the way. Um, <laughs> there's just metallic sproutings coming out. Um, yeah, that's what they were looking for. And uh, I think it's really interesting in using all those names. So I use a lot of the different names for um, plants, both the Latin names and the common names, um, to reveal and, and explore how humans have extracted and manipulated the raw material of plants for our own purposes. So obviously, you probably all know that glassware, you know, as sunfire was commonly burned between the 16th and 19th century in order to release sodium. And that soda ash was fused with sand to make glass. And this discovery, and I read a whole book on this, actually got fascinated. It's intimately connected with the resurgence of English glass making. So the whole kind of history of English glass making, you know, it's totally reliant on sample and what they were doing with that. It wasn't the only halophyte to be used like that. So this little winter sandfire poem has it the line, winter Saint Pierre remembers fused fire with sand. So I'm sort of playing fancifully with the idea that somewhere in its makeup it remembers this, you know, the plant remembers this. That's what I'm allowed to be fanciful. And uh, scurvy grass, which is a plant I absolutely love, it's one of the first plants to flower in the salt marsh every year. People sort of hardly even notice it now. Um, but it was a preventative against scurvy, as the name suggests. It was picked fresh by sailors, or it was taken to sea pickled. And in the um, right hand half of this poem, I've used all those words in italics and found text from Gerard. So they're words to do with its um, high, high content of vitamin C the absorbic bite, the cleansing, the purging. It's meant to be a purging plant and all those, those, those different uh, references to its qualities um, in herbals. So um, that's just to give us a flavour of what I'm doing there with the language of the space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end with a poem I didn't read earlier, uh, which is one of my favourite pages of the book, actually, because I absolutely love this, um, this painting of mm -hmm. thrift. So, as you can see, it's on the screen. But in the book, we look, it's more beautiful from the book than the words inside. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to end by reading this. And one of the reasons I wanted to end with this is that this is now. This is midsummer, which is where we are now and, and what we will see if we go to the marsh now. And also, the poem, spatially, it starts from the middle. The, mid, the title is in the middle, so I thought it might be interesting for you to see that. Middle marsh hard, from tender stalks, bronze sheaths, armoria, white pink thrift, gillyflower. Artemisia, wormwood, infinite fine jags, frond up, shell trail silver white edges. Lavenders purpling, roots wash orange. Suede, sea blight, quirky swirl, red fla flushed green. All push up in sun and rain, hold against wind, flower flow. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, today, uh, both Saltwork and Never Ends are available <laughs> to uh, purchase. Um, if you would, if you've been 
kind of inspired by this, as I have, and you would like to have a copy uh, yourself, there's some copies here, so you can have a look afterwards. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, has anyone got any questions they would like to ask um, Judith and Harriet before we move to the to the round table? I was just wondering which area of the, obviously because when you get towards the yacht club it's like quite, are there some areas that you can't go to and some areas that you can't, just wondering like how you went about, like which bits you went to and which bits you kind of took photographs from afar and... We just sidled around the edges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you can sidle around the edge by walking along the edge of the beach, you know, to see some of it. And then also if you go on the raised path towards Tetley, yeah. you can yeah. look down over it. Yeah, so you don't have yeah. to walk over it, in fact, and no. to see it from the edges. But yeah, it is quite, you know... It's hard to, like, get in. It can't get in, yes. Yeah. Not really meant to be in. No, no. Because <laughs> the red shacks wouldn't there's, like it. There's a little yeah. bit, basically. There's a, there's a really, really small area that we've been working on. If you know the beach, it's just... It's a bit where the sand fibers when you go, go along the beach and hit the marsh yeah, streak. Yeah. Then you are allowed to walk just around that bit where there's a couple of buckthorn mm. sort of copses or whatever mm. you call them. There's a sign saying go yeah. there. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. so this just, is really, just, really yeah. micro in comparison with it. It's literally mm. a tiny, tiny area. Yeah. It's really, really small. small so yeah. 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 But, you, but this thing that we were talking about at the beginning that Paul Nicola was talking about, about really looking at one locality mm. and understanding a lot mm. from one small place is something that we're both really interested in. I think that's another question. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you, do you just use your phone or cameras, whatever it is, to get the magnification or, or do you go yeah. out? <laughs> no, no. no, I mean, I do draw when well I'm out as well. But what I was, another talk would have been all about um, the relation between photography and painting and what that can mean. But I do just use a camera in my phone to get that and go right you up. You are quite light as I do have to call it. I've got a lot of pictures of them in the Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know about that connection between the uh, soda ash and the sample. Mm. Um, which book was that that made reference to it? Oh, Lordy. Oh. oh, well, I'll chase up for you. Oh, yeah, I've got it. I'll give it to you afterwards, actually. It's oh, thank here. You. I've yeah. got my bibliography at the end of the paper. Oh, so. oh thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, just a question for Har Harriet. I, I wonder if, well, probably both of you, any thought of setting your work to music? Oh, we could you bring a musician with your watch? <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> Linda's husband. Yeah. <laughs> my uh, my husband is a composer, and he set some of Harriet's poetry to music. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a particular one, White Went Round You, is uh, is the particular one that he's and he's he's looking at more at the moment. Oh, right. So yeah. yes. but it is great to work with other art forms. Mm -hmm. I have a bit of a related question, actually. I wondered how much sound shapes what you write. Massively. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, basically, that is what poetry is, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it is about that kind of the sonic, both the visual and the sonic. So, yeah, guess, the two things together. Yeah, I guess yeah. kind of, I, I guess more specifically, what I meant is, like, this, like, how much does what you write is what you write affected by what you can hear? Oh, OK, yeah. That's yeah. Yes, that as well. I mean, I think one of the things that's really important and also quite... It's interesting, you referred to it when you said, we told you to smell, smell the hay. Yes, you know, exactly. I think we're trying to keep all your senses <laughs> open and not just the visual. Because I think we're very dominated by the visual mm. um, in our culture. And you do need to try and, you know, hear and listen. And when we did one of our bird... Um, uh, sessions with, with Nicola, I read out loads of um, descriptions in field guides of how birds sound and mm. how people try and write phonetically their mm. sounds mm. And, and how funny it is really because <laughs> every person does it differently for the same yes. but We went through every one for the Red Shack, didn't we? Yeah. And also that that involves people's, that actually has a lot about people's attitudes as well. Mm. So my, my, I wrote a, a um, Home in lockdown, which was about our local area, the birdsong in our local area, because I was meant to be doing one here and I couldn't get here. It's the same thing again. And uh, I looked at a lot of music like Messiaen and people who try and get birdsong into music. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I am quite interested in trying to do that and trying to stay open to all the senses. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, like the comparisons you're talking about with like plant behaviour compared to animal behaviour. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking a bit about how plants sense the world and yeah, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. yeah, and the agency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just thinking about um, what happens in between. So there's the and 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 time in both of your work. So you're researching when you're here, and then. I'm familiar with seeing your work, as it was, at uh, Rofork or in a publication where it comes together. But is there some overlapping coming together in your processes and in between? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, we sort of, we, we exchange work, you know, we sort of look at each other's work as it's going along all the time. And sometimes um, Judy complains that I write too quickly. <laughs> I'm not saying so long, long. <laughs> but the difference between how long it takes to paint. <laughs> I'm just not saying it. I'm always about a year or two behind. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, the editing process is very lengthy. And what I found working with Judy, working with artists, but particularly with her, is that basically you have to constantly rewrite the work. So if you look at that left hand banner there, that is another version of High Marsh Half, the poem that I read at the end. That is on the screen. So you can see the two different versions. I had to do it like that because we were making a banner and because we were doing long, thin poems for Scunthorpe sort of, to go alongside her big painting. And that's how they needed to be. So I'm constantly like using the same words and rewriting them to longer versions, shorter versions, you know, playing around with the space and doing different things with them. So they feel much more fluid than they used to. And, and I mean, we've been working on this for a long time. Yeah, we've been yeah. working on this project for a really long time. In fact, for me, I mean, it's not at all over. I'm planning. I've got several larger paintings on go, and I'm planning another maybe 15 or 20. So I'll probably be quite old by the time. We're also getting really interested in the dunes, which is why it's yeah. so great to have your talk actually, Thank because you. we are moving from salt marsh to dunes. <laughs> so I was scribbling down everything you were saying about the dunes, because yeah, those plants are very exciting too. I think we can move to like the final session.